be a relatively short piece on Mo Dalitz. He really deserves something longer, but I think we needed to get him into this collection. I'm assuming people are learning about organized crime by coming here. And he is, of course, a major, he's a pillar in organized crime. Um, a lot of people say, well, he built Las Vegas, the guy built Las Vegas, blah, blah. No, Mo Dalitz built Las Vegas. And what he did is he built it into what it is today, uh, a convention center, a place to gamble, of course, but a destination vacation. Um, he made it what it is. He went to the mob guys and said, look, you know, you're just going to have casinos. This thing's going to flop. If you want people to come here from as far away as Maine or Florida or even overseas, you're going to have to build things. We're going to need competent people. We can't have these locals doing this. They're used to running teeny casinos. We need to get guys here from New York and New Jersey, California, who know how to handle gamblers. Uh, we need to build houses, infrastructure, gutters, sewers, radio stations, TV stations, hospitals, roads. And they listened to him. And Vegas blew up. It exploded. It's also interesting, by the way, that he invested a lot of money in land, uh, before Vegas was anything compared to what it is today. Anyway, Dalitz was born in Boston, which I, I didn't know that. He was raised in Michigan. His father, uh, Barney Dalitz, he was a professional gambler for a long time, and he put that money into an industrial laundry business in Ann Arbor. And then Mo used the family's trucks, or a lot of trucks, to bring thousands of cases of whiskey across the Canadian border into the U.S., during the prohibition, he had a gang, you know, really more of a collection of vaguely competent young Jewish men uh, who wanted to be gangsters. He eventually worked their way into dealing with what was called the Mayfield Road Boys. Mayfield Road was the point where Cleveland ends in the Lakeshore area, Lake Erie begins. It was also the heart of Little Italy at the time. So they met because they needed each other. And the gang operated uh, eventually, thanks to Prohibition, in Cleveland, Detroit, Ann Arbor. It was around that time, by the way, that Dalitz met Jimmy Hoffa, who was also from Michigan. Hoffa had come to uh, unionize Dalitz's laundry truck drivers. The, the unionization failed. But Dalitz would later give Hoffa an introduction into organized crime and further build Las Vegas. Anyway, Dalitz went into the Army in World War II as a private, came out as a captain. That's, it's impressive. He was a smart guy. Well, when the uh, Kefauver Com uh, Committee came into Las Vegas and they wanted to know what was going on, uh, they said to him, as he said, why were you a, a bootlegger? And he said, well, look, I, sold, I wouldn't have sold booze if you people didn't drink it. Well, you know, it's, it's a good point. He moved in on the Desert Inn Casino uh, when the builder, Wilbur Clark, was running out of money. Him and his guys came in. His partners in Vegas, the f people you could see, were Sam Tucker, Morris Kleinman. Uh, they bought the hotel in 1950. They let Wilbur Clark stay out in front uh, as the face of the operation. Then in 1954, he took over with uh, Tucker and Kleinman being the front guys again, the Stardust Hotel when Tony Canero died. I did a piece on Tony Canero. You can find it in here in October of this year. But unlike virtually everyone around him, because he was around gangsters, thugs, hoods, gamblers, weasels, he didn't handle things with screaming, yelling, gunfire. You know, he's very calm. The writer Hank Messick, if you don't know Hank Messick's work, let me say H-A-N-K, Hank, and then Messick, E-M-S-I-C-K. He's written... He's died now, I'm almost positive, some really good books on the foundation of organized crime. You really should try to read some of his stuff. Anyway, what he said is the reaction of Mo Dalis to a threat was typical of the man and his methods. Even in those pioneering days of rum running across Lake Erie, Dalitz and his associates used others to do the dirty work. Caution, not fear was the basis of their method of operation. Even as young men, they understood the value of insulation, of remaining apart from physical violence. A fellow with brains and cash could always find a man with muscle uh, to deal with the rummies, the, the guys who brought the boats across from Canada. Uh, if necessary, they could do a little killing. I think by that he meant the muscle guys he hired could do a little killing, not Dalitz's guys. I don't think Dalitz was involved with murder. Anyway, that attitude, you know, think first, shoot later, it permeated 
everywhere he went, and it permeated those general agreements he worked out in Vegas between all these mobs who were active in there. Uh, so let's sit down, we'll talk, we'll work it out. We don't have to shoot people, for God's sake. There's a story that Daylitz advised the National Mafia Commission on all things to do in Vegas, and that he pushed for Bugsy Siegel's death. That story comes from Murray Humphreys, who was a, a pillar in the Chicago mob. But, you know, Humphreys was a remarkably competent man, but oftentimes he would say things. He knew the FBI was listening. Uh, they had a dry cleaners bugged, and he would just talk into the dry cleaners and just say things. And I think he did it to elevate himself because he knew the recordings, by the way, could would not be used in court. Uh, they were just gathering intelligence. And so he knew that. How he knew, I don't, I'm sure he had guys on the payroll. But uh, and he, So he would say a lot of stuff and elevate himself. According to him, uh, but again, he was an extremely confident man. But according to him, Dalis came to him and said, look, we got to get rid of Siegel because the guy, is, he's just a loose wheel. He's going to cause problems. If we kill him, we'll get rid of him. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think that's true. Uh, I've written extensively on, a well, I think a greatly researched piece that Siegel was more than probably killed by a nut, a guy who came home from the war, World War II, just his brain was wrecked. He had a lot of problems and he shot Siegel. Why? Because he was Siegel and because the guy was mentally ill. That's why. I mean, they knew Siegel was a thief. You hear this stuff, well, he's stealing. Of course he's stealing from them. They knew, they're thieves. They knew he was stealing. Well, what's the big deal? They knew he was stealing. They knew he was obnoxious. They were obnoxious. So I, I don't know. I don't think a case has been made to show that the mob killed Bugsy Siegel. Anyway, go back to the Mayfield Road Boys, the Italian part of it now. Uh, they grew into this large criminal syndicate up in the 30s. They got out of bootlegging, went into illegal gambling. Then they moved into union control and so forth. So they eventually got into a long-term relationship with the Jewish Cleveland Sigurd, which was Mo Dalitz and Kleiman, uh, Lou Rothkopf, Sam Tucker. Those guys are big names in Las Vegas history. And they are organized Buckeye Enterprises, which was... The, money. They had a lot of money. The Italians and the Jews put their money together and they invested it. They owned everything. Uh, laundries, casinos, nightclubs, oh my gosh, uh, shopping plazas. They owned grocery stores. It was a big profitable deal. In 1949, Daylitz and the Mayfield Boys, who are now essentially the Cleveland mob, to make it as simply as possible, uh, we're moving big time into Vegas, as I said, with the Desert Inn. You know, anybody who was a made member of a mob could have just walked in and told Daylitz, well, you work for me now. And the only reason that didn't happen, and what could Daylitz do about it? The only reason it didn't happen is Daylitz had the Cleveland Mafia behind him. So they left him the hell alone. Uh, his personal wealth exceeded, it's estimated, $100 million. Um, that's what you get when you opened two casinos early on. He, as I said, invested a lot of that in California real estate, Las Vegas real estate. He also invested in television. He put he financed a lot of TV shows and movies. But despite that, he, he zipped around in Las Vegas with a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, the clothes he bought, he bought at retail outlets. And he was proud to tell people he, he would have been at a hardware store in LA and he saw a pair of pants he liked. So he got his pants from there. He doesn't give a damn, you know, but he was very proud of his Jewishness, of his background. He contributed liberally to Jewish causes. He also gave millions and millions of dollars continually to the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. And that being part of his plan to build Vegas into something more than this sort of sleazy gambling place. Anyway, he died of natural causes uh, in 1989. He's one of the few legendary figures in organized crime that you can say correctly that he had never been convicted of a major crime and he built Las Vegas. <laughs>